Um, it's a great honor to be asked to speak here. This is a fabulous conference. I love it. And um, I'm you know, really happy to kind of suggest, a, suggest an idea to you. Um, I'll try not to speak too loudly, because I guess you all have slightly sore heads after last night. Certainly I do, anyway. Um, so so uh, just, I don't want to say much about us, but we haven't done too badly over time. We've done 20 times against the market up five times over 30 years. And um, the way, way we do it is, uh, I mean, not to dwell on this, but we, I think we've been quite good at, um, at spotting companies at a very early stage of their growth cycle uh, before the, kind of the, 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 you know, the world, the analytical community kind of picks up on the idea. And I think the other thing we've been quite good at doing is um, you know, seeing the value of franchises, the value of assets uh, when they're out of favor. Uh, and I guess um, what I wanted to talk to you today a bit about was Entesa San Paolo. And of course, this is, a, we think, a, a really a very um, powerful asset, which of course is kind of quoted and operating both in a very difficult uh, uh, country context, but also, you know, it's uh, an area of the market which is just so depressed and uh, where expectations are incredibly low. And uh, so, so what I wanted to try and do today was just... Um, just first of all, to try and persuade you that Intesa San Paolo actually is quite a lot better than you might imagine, because I guess um, it's, it's very easy just to, um, to kind of group all the Italian banks into one kind of bucket and to not even to think about them. And um, then I wanted to go on to, to kind of look at some of the threats and the challenges. I mean, of course, you know, it's an Italian bank and they own, they own um, Italian bonds and there's risk around that. But also they still have quite a large book of NPLs. Um, but I want to show you that, in, that it's actually not as quite as, um, it's not quite as threatening as in, certainly in some of the other banks. And then finally, we, we tried to look at the bank in all sorts of different ways to get an idea of, the, of, the, of what, the, what the business uh, could be worth. Um, anyway, so Intesa uh, San Paolo, as you know, is the dominant lender. And, and I think the thing which uh, a lot of us don't fully appreciate, but the, the advantage of being number one or number two within, the, within an industry is really very, very significant. So in Taser, are roughly kind of 20% of all lending and deposits. And, uh, and that means you can just be that little bit clever about who you lend to. You've got an extensive branch network, so you can cherry pick uh, with good um, kind of risk knowledge. You can cherry pick some of the best SME loans. And of course, SME sector is the area where you can make the best margins. But also, just by your size, uh, you, can, you can tend to uh, raise money a little bit more cheaply uh, whether it's deposit funding to retailers or whether it's wholesale funding. And, and, and those are small differences, but together they make um, a very significant difference in net interest margin. And, and, and we think that Intesa, just by being the largest, it's probably, has probably already given them one or two hundred basis points um, uh, return on capital difference to the other uh, major Italian banks. So that's a really kind of important factor to look at. And you see the same thing in the British banking market. So Lloyds Bank is the dominant lender and by being the dominant lender, they consistently made two or 300 basis points higher return on capital than uh, Royal Bank of Scotland or Barclays or, or some of the other banks. I think the other thing which will really surprise you, it's an extraordinarily diversified business. Only half of um, the revenues come from good old-fashioned banking, you know, deposit-taking and lending. But the other half comes from a vast, very diverse range of fee income. And it's good, this is good fee income. It's uh, both selling their products to the bank ne network, it's, uh, it's for Durham, it's selling, selling non-life and life insurance products to the bank network. And of course, this is where you get the margin. This is high margin, you know, high PE, good quality business. And we can discuss later on the threats to that business because, of course, with MIFID II and um, all these kind of products are coming under pressure and you have to be more open about what you charge your clients. There are some threats there, but we still think it's a, a business of really great quality. And um, so it's really only half a bank, half is um, this... Uh, this, this kind of wealth manager for the kind of the middle, lower middle classes in, uh, in Italy. And the, the other thing which is, um, well, when we look at banks, uh, you know, I mean, people will say, God, Stuart, how can you have any idea you look at a bank? How can you begin to comprehend what's really inside the balance sheet? And do you really, have you really made sense of all the risks? I think one way you can get a really good look at that is just by looking at how, what the NPL performance has been like, the non-performing loan performance has been like in the previous 10, 20 years. And this is quite a nice little chart. It just shows you net income. I mean, and Tesa, I think, is pretty much the only bank in Europe, but one of the very few banks in Europe, aside from the Swedish and Scandinavian banks, who didn't make a loss through the, through the, um, through the great financial crisis. 
And, uh, and what's extraordinary is even owning 20%, and this is, this is, an, uh, this is a, a kind of bewildering stat, having 20% of the banking system in Italy, their NPL, their non-performing loan experience rate of their loan book, was half of the system. Now, that's incredible. To own 20% of the system, and yet have a non-performing loan experience of half of the system, which is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do when your market share is so... And we all know about Monte Paschi, Siena, and Uli Credit, and some of the other smaller regional banks. But they consistently, uh, and I'll show you later on some, some numbers on non-performing loans, they performed much better than the, um, than the rest of the system. That all goes down to their credit scoring, and, the, and, the, and they have a much more rigorous system around, around approving larger loans than some of the Italian banks do. And uh, this is quite an interesting one. So this is just looking at the kind of key metrics of the bank. And this is another way which tells you all about the quality of a bank. And, um, I was going to put alongside uh, Wells Fargo numbers, but the trouble is that they're quite difficult ones to compare because it's, um, there's different accounting system standards and um, it's quite difficult to disentangle the, the fee income from the banking income in a, in a proper, correct way. But if you were to put um, the Wells Fargo stats beside the Intesa San Paolo stats, and I was to ask you, okay, which one's Wells Fargo, trading one and a half times book, considered the best, one of the best retail banks in the world? You would, have, you would have pointed to the Intesa San Paolo numbers. I mean, they are industry leading. And, um, and there was a, quite an interesting McKinsey survey um, recently looking at banks across the world and quality, the best quality banks. And uh, Intesa came up within the, within the top five. So a cost income ratio of 53% is very unusual. And a lot of that's to do with having a large portion of fee income. But it's a tightly managed business. Uh, proportion of retail funding, 75%. That is just a dream because that's the cheapest funding you can possibly get. Uh, loan to deposit, 95%. Um, payout ratio, 85%, um, uh, which doesn't really, really mean much. It just means that they're not growing much at the moment, and so they can pay out most of their earnings. Return on equity at 9% at this stage of the cycle, which we think is, frankly, extraordinary, when the economy's been very depressed and opposed to great financial crisis. And a CET one of 13.6%. So it's, it's, it's got great, uh, strong characteristics. And uh, just quickly, the other thing... Um, which is really important is, um, is they're in the process, as all you Italians will know, of going through a very deep restructuring process, which is all about reducing the NPL exposure. We can look at that in a minute. But also about you know, digitalization, cutting costs, cutting costs, cutting costs, reducing number of branches, trying to get as many people onto the website as possible to do all their banking transactions, buying life insurance, buying funds, uh, you know, moving money, paying bills, that kind of thing. Uh, and also they're working hard, which is the more challenging bit on the revenue growth side, so, um, I mean, clearly, banking is going to be challenging to grow loans in a very moribund economy, but, but uh, there may be an opportunity to be able to grow insurance products and to develop private banking further. And uh, so these are the targets they've come out with, and they're quite kind of punchy. So we see NPLs going, we'll look at this again in a minute, from 5.5% to 2.9%, which becomes a very manageable number. We see the CET1 staying about the same rate. The really significant figure is the cost-income ratio uh, in the plan comes down to 45%, and the return on equity rises to 12%. And um, so you say, wow, these are kind of, kind of punchy numbers, but what does it assume? What, what's the kind of assumptions around about growth? This is all about operational leverage. But interesting there, it really assumes very modest revenue growth. So um, net interest income of 3% per annum, that's kind of what they've done. That's the growth in the economy. And uh, so we think that should be achievable. It's what they've been able to do in the past. And, and then the other part of it, net fee income, 5.5%, maybe a little bit aggressive. But again, it's, it's kind of it's what they've been able to do in the past, and that's by gaining share. It's by, it's by this whole thing of um, you have a client and you offer them more and more internal products. And you're able to do that because it's, it's easier for the client to buy it because it's now done on the website. Um, so the, so the, the assumptions, we think, are pretty modest. It's all about very deep uh, cost-cutting. And of course, the big pushbacks and this, and we'll look, when we look at the valuation, we can kind of, I think we can try and we can isolate the, the being part of Italy effect. But the big pushback, of course, in all of this is that, um, you know, they're an Italian bank. And uh, I mean, I think we're reasonably relaxed about that, being kind of Europeans, and we just kind of, it's all part of the kind of European political backdrop. That's just how we do things in Europe. But of course, um, our, our American clients just find the kind of the whole idea of investing in kind of Italy or Britain with Brexit just kind of bewildering and impossible. So you've got, you've got to kind of understand that. So they have 30 billion of Italian bonds, and their tier one is 110 billion. So it's 27% of their equity, which is a big, big, big number. I mean, what we did is we said if Italy comes out of the euro, 
and then there'll probably be a 30% haircut on bonds. Well, that's manageable. I mean, clearly there'll be all sorts of other things will happen to the economy. Um, but again, it's manageable. It's, uh, it's not obvious they would need extra capital, uh, uh, with a, even with a 30% haircut. And of course, the reason why, I mean, it's a difficult one. They're, they're not obliged to have Italian bonds, but of course, the yields are much higher than by owning German or French bonds. And, and the other big pushback, and we can have a good chat about this after, but the MPL backdrop is, isn't great. And, um, but, it, but it's not as bad as you think. I mean, clearly, at the top of the crisis, um, you know, it's, it's a huge number. This gross MPLs were 17% of the book. Net MPLs, 10%. But it's interesting where we are now, and um, so I'm incredibly, incredibly blind. I can't read my own slides. But we get down to a number where we're 4% we're net MPLs. I mean, it's still a big part of equity. Equity is 13%. So it's still kind of 30% of equity. Uh, but it is coming down very significantly, and they're working, you know, they're working really hard to be able to pull this under control. And as part of the business plan, they can get it down to 3%. And that would be um, basically, um, that would be uh, just continuing to, um, to, to solve or to, um, or, or to work through problem loans at the same rate as they've been able to do in the past. I think one thing, and, uh, and again, I'm probably going to have a, from people like Massimo, I'm probably going to have a big pushback on this. But I think there's, um, I mean, clearly, a part of the NPL problem is that the Italian economy uh, you know, all sorts of the Italian economy grew very fast into the crisis, and they're all sorts of very un uneconomic areas uh, where, where, where money was lent to, and then we've had this period of stagnation. Um, but it's a bit more complicated than that because a large chunk of the loans are secured. They're property, they're property secured, small SMEs. And, uh, and also, um, it's a very labyrinthine process, this whole thing of putting a, a you know, of, of the banks being able to get their money back. And it's, of course, it's the... Um, post-war kind of, I guess, socially democratic tradition in Italy, where it's all about giving businesses and individuals as long as possible to, get, to be able to get their money back, to be able to rework their business. And um, so, so, so it normally takes about seven years in order for a, for a, for a bank to be able to get back its uh, defaulted loan. So, so there's a small business where the property is secured against uh, the family home. Uh, then there's all sorts of appeal processes. There's lots of second, third, fourth chances before the bank can actually take the property back and to be able to cover the, the loan loss. And a big chunk of the NPLs came in 2015. So, so our guess is this number could come, we could even get surprises, could come down more quickly than, than, than we expect. So that's something to be really cognizant of. I mean, 2.9% is still a big number, but it's a hell of a lot less than the rest of the system. And the other thing which is quite comforting is NPL coverage is high. I mean, 55%, that basically splits into two things. So, so stuff which isn't secured will be 85% covered. And uh, stuff which is nicely secured by properties is kind of um, 30 or 40 percent covered. And that would be using um, you know, recent real estate kind of valuations. Um, our guess is they're probably the most conservative of the lenders at how they've worked out their MPL coverage. And, and I guess the other new and quite maybe surprising thing when you look at the context of the Italian economy and uh, how, how, you know, the growth has been, how the growth has been lacking, but um, new MPLs are at the lowest level we've seen for years. And, um, I mean, that's an astonishing number. I mean, look at those big new MPLs coming in in the period 2012, 2015, and where they are now. It's, um, and that's all to do with being much more careful lending policies. And um, uh, so I think that's kind of, that's kind of quite, a, quite an encouraging chart. So then thinking about valuation. And this is the kind of complex one, because, of course, there are just so many ways to think of the kind of the Italian bank, the Italian sovereign angle, and also the kind of, within the context of the restructuring program and, and the valuation itself today. But wow, you know, to be trading on a discount to book when you're generating at this stage a 9% you know, return on capital and you're yielding 9%, it's quite an aggressive valuation. I mean, it goes back to this big challenge we all have as value investors. I mean, it's the last four or five years, unless you've bought allegedly fraudulent uh, German payment companies, you know, it's been very difficult to make money. The kind of this whole kind of momentum uh, mania, it's been very hard to, but wow, this, I mean, this to me kind of looks better than buying a allegedly fraudulent, you know, wire cards, you know, payment companies in, in Germany. I mean, wow. And then disentangling the numbers a little bit, you know, if we're going to do like a very simple DCF on it, you know, using very conservative assumptions, we say operating profit grows at 5% a year. We say a return on tangible book of 9.6%, which is um, not assuming that they get the business plan works. 
uh, we, we assume a very high cost of equity, 11%, because it's Italian and all the risk. And we still get a share price of 2.6, which is, um, gives us 20% from here. But my guess is um, my guess it's worth much more than that. And, and what I've tried to do here is just look at, well, let's say they get to the business plan target. And it's not so crazy. I mean, the assumptions aren't that aggressive. It's mainly about cost cutting rather than leverage on top line growth. So you say they get to their 12%, you still use a very high 11% cost of equity, Italian risk, and I mean 11% cost of freaking equity. Wow. I mean, even with where an Italian bond's yielding now, in my 30 years of doing this job, I've never seen a risk premium like this before. This is extraordinary. This is a risk premium that the Latin American countries have. You know, it, it's, it's extreme, and yet you still get a share price of uh, something just under four euros a share. But then if you start to say, well, okay, um, at some stage, the kind of easings of tensions within Europe and the Italian economy starts to grow and the spread against the Bund falls. And we get a Bund spread bef since before we had the, um, the creation of the populistic government last year. And you say, well, okay, let's say a cost of equity of 9%. And 9% is um, it's still a very high risk premium. And the cost of equity, you know, and elsewhere in, hard, in, in old hard currency Europe would, be a, would still be a bit less than that. You get a share price... Uh, Somewhere around, uh, somewhere around five euros. So, so, so to, to me, this looks very, this looks very intriguing. And, um, and I guess just in summary, um, you know, I think it's just, you know, if you if you kind of go over the file and you look at the bank, wow, it really is a hell of a lot more quali better quality than you might expect. It's, you know, arguably one of the strongest, if it wasn't an Italian bank, strongest banks in the world. And. Um, and you know, with great cost incomes ratio, with a very nice return equity, even at this stage of the cycle, it's going through a very deep, very profound restructuring, which should, even in a weak economic environment, push the return on equity up to a high level. And I think whatever way you play the numbers, um, you know, the upside is really very significant. E even if you just assume they get somewhere near to making the business plan, um, and, and if, of course you get that ad added bonus if um, the risk premium around Europe and around Italy can. Uh, can reduce somewhat. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's really all for me. I mean, I guess there'll be lots and lots of <laughs> pushback and questions um, around MPLs and sovereign risk and all that kind of stuff. Um, but again, these are the kind of things we're we're kind of really intrigued at at the moment. We we struggle in the in the growth sector. Everything's so expensive, and uh, you know this premium for so-called being momentum and safety. It's um, it seems to us there's um, there's value in the value area of the market, like. I haven't seen it for years and years and years, and um, but it continues like this. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, for one question, I, when I look at uh, Capital IQ, I see an equity of seven and a half percent, and um, you stated it's twelve. What's the difference? So when you look at uh, Capital IQ, I see an equity ratio of seven and a half. So if which IQ? Which the Capital, Capital IQ, IQ is just its own balance sheet. Sort of Bloomberg, sort of fact set. On, on, on the return on no on the equity ratio I see I just take the plain equity uh, to the uh, total balance sheet sum and that's seven and a half percent so well, well the, 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 the tier one um, as defined by you know the Basel committee that's about thirteen and a half percent that's an absolutely and that's something which is approved by the ECB so, so they must be looking at a different level of t equity capital that, that maybe that's excluding subordinated debt or something like that no, I mean, they probably, uh, the way it's calculated was by Basel 1, 2, 3, is that they always say this asset is risk-free, this asset is risk-free, as oh, So they adjust the numbers themselves? No, I mean, that is Basel 1, 2 uh, doing. And uh, when I look at balance sheets, uh, I only take the real equity in the balance sheet, and that is 7.5. So if you, if you say the NPLs are for, uh, what are they, 7? So they are uh, uh, the so same So it's amount. net about 4.5% at the moment of, of the balance sheet. Yeah, no, what I'm saying is the real equity is 7.5, not 12. If you, if you assume that, for example, bonds also have risk, in Basel too, they don't have risk, but if you assume they do have risk, then, then you come up with a different equity ratio. That's the one I always take when I look at bank, banks. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess there are all sorts of different ways of thinking, thinking about equity. And... Um, I'm not, I suppose you, I suppose you've, I mean, well, one thing you can be sure of is certainly the banks have a hell of a lot more equity than they did before the crisis. And if I look at comparable ratios, a bank like Intesa would have been operating on, using the same methodology as today, they would have been operating on a, 
on a tier one of kind of 7%, whereas now they're operating on at 13.5%. Um, so there's a lot more capital. Uh, I, I'd have to, we, I, we'll have to look at the, your numbers. Um, it's just a different definition, definitional thing. It, it, probably in reality, it probably excludes subordinated debt. Something like that, I'm guessing. Yeah. But subordinated debt is capital. Um, Anybody else? No? Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Stuart. I have a question regarding what do you think the growth opportunities of this company are? Because obviously having such a huge presentation in the market, I mean, I don't think they can grow really anymore. So do you see any growth drivers of them going in some other country, somewhere else, to try uh, to merge with some other companies? Very interesting. So, so, so they, they describe, um, so, so I guess lending is the unlikely to gain market share, and that's they'll grow with the economy. And hopefully they'll do a bit more profitably because they have the advantage of cheaper funding and they, they have the opportunity to be able to cherry pick loans. They have a, as it were, a better kind of knowledge network to be able to pick the riskiest loans and to price them correctly. So, so the three main growth drivers then come from the, um, from the fee side. And the first part they talk a lot about, there's a, there quite a few clients who only have one product. And it's the whole thing of persuading them then to buy their insurance through Intesa San Paolo rather than using an independent or... And, and, I guess the way you do that, it's, um, it's, it's uh, I mean, the old way it was, it was when people would come into the branch and then the, the manager would, would try to persuade them to buy other products. Now um, they believe they've got a great chance of success because everything is done through the website. And uh, so it's, you can see it on the website and it's kind of easy and you can see the op offer and you can see the, you know, the, um, the, the, the price discount to what you're paying for your insurance already. So that's the first thing they talk about. Uh, the second thing they talk about is private banking in Italy. And it's a difficult one because, of course, there are lots of very able private banks. Um, but they reckon that some of their wealthiest clients use Intesa de San Paolo could be persuaded to use their private banking products too. And, um, I mean, at the moment, it's a tiny, tiny number. And, uh, but the hope is that they'll be able to, uh, to be able to get some clients there. And, and the other part they talk a lot about is, is basically looking after um, Italian individuals abroad. So in London now, they certainly have quite a large office. And it seems they've got a surprisingly large number of um, wealthy Italians living in London who, where they're looking after all their financial needs. But it's tough. I mean, maybe that's the, maybe that's the weakness of um, the business plan, the 5.5% um, fee growth. It might be a little bit aggressive. But again, it's what they've managed to achieve in the past. And it, you know, it's very carefully, very well thought through. And when you go through the different parts, it doesn't look that aggressive. It just assumes a few more people taking on a few more products, very small percentages, getting a bit, little bit more business in these small private banks they set up all over Europe, and then gaining one, well, not one or two, but you know, a very small percentage of people who are looked after, wealthy people in Italy who are looked after by the other private banks to come to Intesa San Paolo. Um, and they should be able to offer things, because with that kind of size, you should be able to offer stuff like access to private equity, which the other private banks can't give you. I mean, that's what they talk about, access to private equity. They, you can borrow money very, very cheaply if you're in Intesa San Paolo, uh, uh, which the, uh, the other private banks don't offer. Um, you've got this whole range of funds, which perhaps you won't get access to unless you, in Tesla San Paolo, can offer you that because they're bigger than anybody else. Uh, the private banks tend to have a more limited offer of the funds they can offer, you know, they sell. Uh, but no, it's a good, good point. I think that's maybe the weakness of the, of the business plan, or the more ambitious part of the business plan. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Last chance. Okay, Th thank you so much. Sure.